You know, Administrator Riley, it is so great to see you again. And, and thank you for being here to help us celebrate the history and legacy of EPA's Climate Partnerships Program. Uh, as you know, we just published a report, which I have right here, that's celebrating EPA's 30 years of, of climate partnerships. You served as EPA's administrator 30 years ago, and you oversaw the launch of the Green Lights Program, of course, was the agency's first voluntary climate initiative, uh, where EPA worked collaboratively with businesses to try to encourage the adoption of energy efficiency lighting. It was revolutionary at the time. Can you tell us a little more about why you and EPA decided to try this voluntary model? Well, I appreciate so much that report and I have read it and uh, the numbers are so compelling undeniably successful program, like so much of what EPA has done. I have always conceived of EPA as um, the Department of the Environment, as the place that is primarily responsible for health and ecology and putting them all together. That uh, program did so in a, in a very unifying way. The Green Lights program was brought to me by John Hoffman, and uh, at the time I smiled and said, so you're telling me that uh, you have figured out and EPA has figured out how to save industry a lot of money, which they haven't known and are not aware of. And I said to, I said, John, it's at a, at a minimum, it's, it's counterintuitive, how shall I say? And I said, get me the data. Well, he, he buried me in data and very compelling data. And before long, the country began to pick up on it. And we saw compact, compact fluorescent uh, lighting in all of the hotels around the country and in so many other public places. And then finally, uh, the private market took them up as well. Just one instance of where EPA, which ordinarily is thought of as a, an agency of compulsion, of, of indictments, of uh, law of enforcement and the rest, had another mission too. And that was drawing on the best impulses of the public, which were benign toward the environment and finding realization ways for them to to do something that was important to the environment and turned out to be very important to the economy as well. One of the first conversations I had with uh, Secretary of the Department of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, was on or about Energy Star. You know, Energy Star is the best known partnership program at EPA, and it's often referred to as the most successful voluntary government program in history. So what, what made Energy Star so successful? Well, you know, uh, it took on a life of itself. And uh, I'm reminded of a conversation I had with the uh, builder of the Los Angeles Dodgers Stadium, who is a prominent builder in, in California, who said, uh, you know, the single most successful law and regulation that you ever administered wasn't even a law or a regulation. It was Energy Star. <laughs> You cannot get lending, get a mortgage for any substantial building in the state of California if it's not going to be Energy Star qualified. Well, so quite clearly, the banks deserve a great deal of credit for that. They believed it. So did the architects. Architects also popularized it. And uh, I remember it when the EPA had its own headquarters redone a few years ago, the Energy Star and, and getting a platinum recognition as well were uh, vital and they are very prominently displayed on the front of, on the, front of the building. But so it, it, was a, it was a community wide kind of thing that Energy Star, you know, I think we're going to rebuild the entire uh, housing estate, building estate in the United States within the next 25, 35 years. So you very much want the new buildings to conform to a standard of efficiency, insulation that uh, perhaps the, the old buildings did not. This is this was this is the path of the future, and I I've hardly heard a word negative about it. You know, it's it's interesting. I mean, most of us uh, aspire in public service to have a a lasting impact, and you know, Energy Star, obviously internationally respected and known. I mean, you must be extremely proud uh, of of the accomplishments of this program. Oh, I I am very proud of it, and proud of what. EPA did with it. I mean, the, the remarkable, probably generally unsung reality is that the agency is full of people who are not just uh, 
improving their resume or earning money or getting famous, but who are really dedicated to the, yes. to the core mission. And one measure of that is how many veterans you have who are in the Peace Corps. EPA has the most of any agency of the government, most alumni of the Peace Corps. Well, that, that's, a, that's evidence of a very strong conscience, of a very uh, serious commitment to helping people. And the, it was a fact that I think, I used to think that some of these voluntary programs were extremely energizing for the people who administered them because they were, you know, if you're regulating and you're bringing enforcement actions and you're uh, investigating and, and testing and monitoring and so forth, it's uh, that's sometimes adversary, often adversary, not sure. always fun. And uh, you're not bringing anything that uh, everybody immediately applauds to say the least. Well, this was an alternative that did all of those things. And, um, and I, used to, I used to respect the fact that, that people would get so excited when they would see that what they had discovered and the data they produced was embraced yeah. and, and was having an impact without having to, um, to threaten or cajole or go into court. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's just been amazing to see the compliment as you've laid it out. Most people think about EPA solely as a regulatory agency and anti-business and anti-economic development. But when you introduce into the conversation uh, programs like Energy Star, you know, first you get a, a reaction that people really didn't know Energy Star resided in EPA. But then, you know, it, it makes that conversation more balanced that EPA is both voluntary and regulatory and it, and it takes both. And I think as we sort of round the corner and really look at the climate crisis and what it requires, uh, it requires both the, the voluntary measures, the behavioral changes and the regulatory activities along with the economic signals that we need, uh, that we know will create millions of jobs and, and keep uh, America globally competitive. And so, you know, at EPA, I think we're building on your idea and we're gonna use every tool in our toolbox to tackle the climate crisis head on, uh, to tackle pollution head on. I think the agency's climate partnerships program will continue to play a critical role alongside the agency's regulatory programs for the foreseeable future. Uh, they're able to drive action in places and in ways that the federal regulations simply cannot do on their own. And so I think you really were on to something in identifying that these voluntary programs are uniquely able to drive action in the private sector uh, that are not as adversarial uh, as well as in state and local policy. And, and they encompass tens of thousands of organizations that instead of hiding from EPA, they're actually lined up and waiting to work alongside the federal government on some pretty critical and ambitious goals. Uh, well so, so we're really proud of that. You're, you are there at a very crucial time for the country, for the environment, for the planet. And, um, and obviously you care about these tools. I'm so pleased that you chose to recognize those today on this 30th anniversary. I, I, absolutely. And, you know, I have to say that I am excited. You've given us a lot to build on. When I look at some of the savings that you started, uh, that we've looked at since 1992, uh, $50 billion uh, in saving, 6 billion uh, metric tons of CO2 reduced. You know, those are huge numbers. Uh, the 6 billion number, uh, those are the total cumulative savings from all of these programs since 1992. That's more than all of the carbon emissions for the entire country in 2019. I mean, it's just, just really astonishing. amazing. It's just fabulous. It's just fabulous. And it's more than the, well, uh, the airplane industry contributes to, I think that's something in the nature of 3%. I mean, it, 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 in perspective, that is an extraordinary achievement. Well, and, and it's just such a, a good news story for the planet. It's a good news story for public health. Uh, you know, the cost savings make these programs a win-win because they're helping American families hold on to more of their hard-earned money. I mean, it's just such a great story. Couldn't agree more. 
Oh, that's absolutely true. Well, I, I bet 30 years ago, you, you just didn't believe you'd be hearing statistics like this. And, you know, <laughs> I can't help but just say how proud I am uh, to be able to, to, to take that baton uh, that you've passed to a couple of people prior to me, but now to me, uh, to just continue to further this work. Well, you're great to say so, but I didn't have those numbers in those days. What we had was good data, good analysis, very aggressive and, and imaginative people at EPA. But uh, you really, you really made the case. And those numbers I was not familiar with until you issued the report. And uh, I just was, uh, I guess, I can't say I was really astonished because I knew it had swept the country, but uh, that their numbers are so large in terms of of greenhouse gas reductions is uh, is a fabulously uh, reassuring kind of thing. We can solve these problems. Well, and, and I can tell you, Administrator, we we don't we don't take that lightly. We know we have the tools. And I was just you know looking at the IPCC report that was issued uh, recently, and you know when I think about the picture that it paints in terms of the impact of climate change. Uh, I still remain very optimistic and recognize that the future is bright uh, because there are so many opportunities to think about how we combat pollution and climate change and do it in a way where it advances society. And luckily, we have in President Biden, uh, a president who's deeply committed to combating this crisis while creating jobs. You know, on day one, the president tasked EPA specifically with setting forward leading standards that would reduce greenhouse gas pollution while simultaneously driving technological innovation, investments, and keeping an eye on the opportunity for good paying jobs. So that's what we're laser focused on doing, uh, but we know we have a lot of work to do. And we know we have a, a lot of tools in our toolbox, but it's gonna take every single tool uh, and these nimble programs, uh, both the regulatory programs and the voluntary programs uh, like the ones you've created uh, 30 years ago uh, to really be competitive and achieve these climate goals. So I have to say, I, I'm incredibly, incredibly optimistic about where we're headed. Uh, I'm honored again to be carrying the baton that you once held. And I really appreciate you joining me, Administrator Riley, and, and all that you've done for EPA and beyond. I would just... Uh just support very enthusiastically your integration of the jobs issue and additions to the environmental protection message. I think the way that uh, the president and you have presented the challenges that we have is itself compelling and unifying. And unfortunately, very regrettably, we have a lot of people in the country who, uh, who don't get the climate message and have to be brought around. And I think that they are much more likely to understand a unifying kind of yes. economic yes. and environmental policy that's quite genuinely concerned with both. And that is what you have communicated so well. I compliment you. I think it's been terrific. And uh, it's exactly the message the country needs to hear, especially that part of the country that, uh, that still um, questions climate change. Yes, yes. Well, I, I tell you, uh, this day and time is harder to separate environmental protection and jobs and economic prosperity. Uh, it's harder to separate them than, than to unite them. It's so clear that there is ample opportunity to do both and do them well. And we're gonna keep building on that. And I think going back to 1992 and, and Energy Star and, and fast forward to today, uh, there's a proven track record that we can combine pollution reduction and economic competitiveness, and it's not uh, a false choice. Well, you speak with great conviction and given those numbers, great authority. So I think that you're <laughs> going to be listened to. And I'm uh, one of the people cheering you on, Michael. Good luck. Thank you, sir. And look forward to continue to have you as a partner as we conquer these new territories. I'm so glad you're there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,